Um, we can't do it alone. We're not alone. Let the Spirit help. That's what I'm going to talk about this morning. Before we do that, take 60 seconds, turn to your neighbor or somebody around them, and tell them what superpower you would like to have, if you could have any superpower and why. And being really rich is not a superpower, by the way, okay? Right, do that 60 seconds. What superpower? If you could have any superpower you'd have, and what would it be? Tell them why. We've got 30 seconds left. Okay, start to finish up. Start to finish up. Anybody around you that was, that said invisibility for their superpower, watch those people. Okay, there's something wrong with them. Anybody that said invisibility shouldn't, you know, you know, you know, stay away from, stay away from. Okay, it's it's a it's a quirk of the human condition, a strange thing about humanity, that you know we can progress and achieve and get things done so well and so much that it gets into almost the realm of superpowers, the things that we can achieve now that we couldn't achieve. 10, 20, 100 years ago are, are unbelievable. The first time I saw a rocket booster fall out of the sky and all the rockets come out of it and they landed on a wee land and pan the side of a, the size of a, a tennis court in the middle of the sea, whatever, with those SpaceX things. I thought, I thought, it's literally been my whole life I've wanted to see a rocket actually just land by itself like in the old movies. We have this incredible power for creativity, for art, for music, uh, for laughter, for relationship, for ingenuity, for invention, for progress, for love, and for sacrifice. Man and women made in the image of God can do incredible things. Yet it's a quirk of the human nature that despite all of that, we continually suffer from the same old, same old disappointment. You know, you're, you're never going to let me die. Lord, we'll sing that because we're always scared about disappointment and doubt and despair and capacity for jealousy and hatred and simple mistakes and not learning from things and so on and so forth. The capacity for pride and for hatred. It's the quirk of the con human condition that despite all of those things, in a sense, we're still the same old, same old. And the thing that I'm going to talk about today is this third great sign. And if you've got your phones, uh, Bibles in front of you, whatever, you can look it up in Acts chapter 2. This third great sign uh, that presents to us uh, in the church uh, God's work and his meaning is power. There's so much else more to this, but this third great sign after the incarnation, after the resurrection, is the birth of the church in the, the new and afresh coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. We can't do this alone. We're not alone. Let the Spirit help. So I don't know about your week just passed. Um, uh, or maybe you've had a time like this in your life where you've started to struggle a bit. Things aren't working out the way that you want them to work out. The pressure's building, problems with work, uh, relationships going badly wrong. There's something going on in your own mind, whatever it might be. The problems seem to be yours and yours alone. Uh, to deal with. You start to ask questions of yourself. How am I going to get this done? How am I going to achieve these things? Even today, how am I going to achieve these things even today? Um, what am I going to do? What am I going to say? Um, where am I going to go from here? And that great question that I ask myself two or three times a week, where am I even going to start with this? And we have a whole series of questions about our life sometimes all the time, and they're I questions. What am I? How am I? Where am I? And all of that, they're I questions because we feel like we're alone, that we can't do it alone, and that we're not alone. And the thing I'm going to challenge us today is this challenge to let the Spirit help. 
In Acts chapter 2, let's do a little bit, quick bit of context again. You know the story, I'm sure, really, really well, but a little bit of context again. 2,000 years ago, Jesus has, uh, he has died, and we've had the resurrection, and we've had 40 days of him spending time with the disciples and followers and teaching them things and coming and going and doing all of that. He is there physically with them. And then at the day of his ascension, which is 40 days um, after resurrection, the day of his ascension. And remember what I said last week that the church likes to mark these things in seasons to help us to remember them. He says then that you're going to get a helper that's going to come and that that helper who has been promised to them um, is going to give his followers the power, the words, and everything else that they need to build his church. Go to Jerusalem, wait for the helper. So they go to Jerusalem. It's the festival of the weeks, one of the three great festivals um, that the Jews have lots of festivals, but the festivals of Passover and Tabernacles and weeks are the big festivals. So um, the festival of Passover happens during the crucifixion of Christ. And then the festival of weeks, seven weeks later, is a festival that really celebrates harvest as well as a number of things. And there's loads of people from all over the world gathered in Jerusalem. So this is all part of the, the time. And the disciples are gathered together in one room. And if you read Acts 2 in front of you, that you'll know that, um, in the words of Father Dougal, it all goes a bit mad, Ted, right? It all goes a bit mad. What do we hear about when we, when we read it out? Okay, so the, uh, the Spirit comes. There, there is uh, what seems like tongues of fire on their head. Um, they, uh, there's a sound, this rushing, of, like a rushing wind. Remember when John said he would baptize with water, but somebody was going to come after him. The Savior is going to come after him. He's going to baptize with fire, and with the Holy Spirit. And this all happens. The, the, the followers, they run out into the street, so they do, um, and they start praising God in all of these different languages of all those different people that we can never pronounce uh, rightly. And sorry for that, they're forgetting that part of the reading. And uh, from all these different nations in the known world in the, in the Mediterranean uh, basin. And Jews from all over the world at that point are the known world ask this question, and it's a really important question. What does this mean? Or in the vernacular, what the heck is going on here? What does this mean? Well, let me say two quick things as to what, what this means. First of all, the Holy Spirit has come, but it's not the Holy Spirit's first rodeo, as they say. The Holy Spirit was there in the beginning of Genesis chapter 1, hovering over the waters. The Holy Spirit, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were there from the beginning. John chapter 1 tells us this too about Jesus, God's Son, there from the very beginning. The Holy Spirit was upon people all the way through uh, the, the, the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit came on power and anointed people the whole way through the Old Testament. So this is not the first time that the Holy Spirit shows up, right? The Trinity does not come about simply um, uh, at the day of Pentecost. It's there. Uh, God in the Trinity has been there from the start. So firstly, it's not the first time that the Holy Spirit shows up. Secondly, though, the tongues, the mighty fire, the languages, and all these signs and wonders are not the main thing that's going on at this point. They're not the main thing. Do you remember Elijah's in the cave and the rushing wind and the fire goes past and the earthquake that can crack mountains goes past? But what is God in? God's in the whisper, right? There's wonderful signs and wonders that go on here, but they're not the main thing. And that's something for us always to remember. The signs and the wonders have the express purpose as in everything to see God glorified. Not because God's got an ego problem or anything like that there, because the whole fabric of the universe lies and is in God. He is in all things and he is before all things and through him all things were made. So when we praise and we glorify God, it's about the universe coming to perfection, right? So all the signs and wonders like everything else in life are supposed to give God the glory. But the signs and the wonders are also for something else to do because God's chief purpose after that is to see his people reconciled to him and come to faith and to know Christ. And so all the signs and the wonders are for that. There is no point in a sign and a wonder and a healing happening in your life if you're not reconciled with God. The pastor told me a story years and years ago that I never forgot where he went to pray with a man who had terminal cancer and he prayed that God's mighty power would come on him and heal him. And God in his mercy did that and healed the man. And then they lost touch. But years later, he came across the, the, the guy just in the street or whatever he was. He just met him by accident. He said to him, how are you getting on? Getting on well, blah, blah, blah. What church are you going to? And he says, the guy looked really sheepish. And he said, I don't really go to church anymore. 
He was healed of terminal cancer, but it was not enough to keep him going to church and keep him involved with Christ. And I could tell you many other stories like that. In other words, the miracle and the sign and the wonder in and of itself is not enough for a person. The greater the miracle is the one that happens in the human heart. The new thing that happened that day was not just the advent of the Holy Spirit, but it was a new way of people being reconciled to God through the Holy Spirit and not through the laws went before, but through the church, through this personal infilling of the Holy Spirit in people's lives. Not that the Holy Spirit didn't do that before, but this is a new way of doing it. And it's because it is all about the human heart. There is no point in you and I searching for signs and wonders when the human heart is not dealt with. So great as they were, the bigger thing was going on here was the human heart. And why the human heart? Because God wants in the human heart the Holy Spirit to come to, to people in three ways. Through the person, the personification of Christ, through the presence of Christ, and through the power of Christ. The personification, the presence, and the power of Christ. Let me talk about this first one here. The Holy Spirit is not an outside force working like an angel. The Holy Spirit is one with the Father and the Son. One God, three expressions. So the Holy Spirit is God's work within us. In John chapter 16, it says these words. Jesus says these words. The Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the Father are all one. He is the Holy, he, so the Holy Spirit is the personification, the person of Jesus. And that means something really interesting. It means that the Holy Spirit is not a stranger. It means that when you ask the Holy Spirit to be in your life, you're not doing something a wee bit weird. And a wee bit like me as well, because I'm not kind of naturally a charismatic with a, C, with a small C or a large C kind of person. Um, I'm really not. You can maybe pick it up from me, a grumpy person or whenever you come across me, right? Okay, that's not what I am sort of naturally, right? And so I used to be a little bit scared of letting anything happen in my life that I didn't have control over. And I used to be a little bit scared of it being the Holy Spirit because he wasn't just maybe as trustworthy as God the Father or, or God the Son. A wee bit of that nonsense that goes on in your head, right? But the Holy Spirit is the personification of Christ as well. If you read verse 4 in chapter 2, you will find out that the followers of Christ were able to speak in those tongues as the Spirit enabled them. They were not possessed. They were not forced into something. Uh, they were not uh, without agency. They were able to do it as they were enabled. In other words, they accepted the Holy Spirit's work into the life to do those things, while others may not have. But those are the ones that did. You have a choice, just as they did. Do you want the Holy Spirit working in your life, infilling your life, and filling you, as Jesus said, to a cup that overfloweth, or do you not? You can't do life alone, but you're not alone. Let the Spirit help. Secondly, when we read all the way through um, the story to verse 13, and then we start into, which wasn't read out today because it's too long, but then we start into the speech that Peter gives, we discover that the Holy Spirit is the presence of Jesus. The Holy Spirit is the presence of Jesus. The story is told of the last, I think this is the last soldier to be shot and killed in Northern Ireland. It was a young man called Stephen Resterick. He was shot at a checkpoint many, many, many years ago. Uh, this woman told the story of going to cradle him in her arms as he lay down. And she said words that I'll never forget in the story. She said, he seemed so alone. And without Christ in your life, there will be moments when you are utterly alone. With Christ in your life, there will be moments that you feel alone, but you're not alone. The, the presence of the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is with you. A Christian is never alone. Now, I understand that we will feel that way. I understand that we, without the physical presence of a person in the room, will feel like a, a blind man wondering if anybody else is actually there because they can't see them and they can't hear them. Um, but God is there, and it is, it is no shame for you to constantly cry out that God would make his presence felt in the Holy Spirit in your life, almost physically even. A small child will constantly look to their parents for reassurance that they're there. It's okay for you and I to do the same with our Heavenly Father, to say, God, are you there? 
please will you make yourself known to me. We can't do it alone. We're not alone. Let the Spirit help. And thirdly, the Holy Spirit is the power of Christ. Now, what does it mean, the power of Christ? Well, we mean the means, the means to do it. The same Holy Spirit that's there at creation, the same Holy Spirit that's there and uh, hovering over the waters in Genesis 1 is the same Holy Spirit that flows through any Christian that asks. When you read the, the rest of this passage, you see a failure of a man in Peter. Um, he has let down Christ in the biggest possible way. He has been then restored by Christ. You see the Holy Spirit come upon him in such a way, an uneducated fisherman, that he is able to get up uh, and do one of their great sermons or evangelistic uh, outreach talks, whatever you want to call it, really in the history of the church. Few have been spoken more powerfully since. He quotes from Joel, and 3,000 were added to the number that day. You see the zero go to hero, if you like. Uh, although Peter would never say that because it was all in the power uh, and through the blessing of Christ. This is what you get in the power of Christ. This is where Paul talks about the, the jars of clay. You know, I joke about this and say to people, you know, the Bible says you're like an ordinary jar of clay, and you guys are doing really well at that because you're so ordinary, it's unbelievable, right? Okay. And, and you're so ordinary that it really means that God is, is you know, uh, God's greatness can be seen in much greater, you know, so we can see that there's all surpassing greatness is from God and not from us. Well, folks, you guys are so ordinary on average that God is blessed and seen even more, right? And that is the whole point in that passage. It's to show that you and I as ordinary people and the power of the Holy Spirit can do extraordinary things. But remember that those extraordinary things, we want them to be seen in terms of great signs and wonders because if we're being honest with ourselves, we'd love to be part of something that just looks amazing that other people would talk about, that we would be a little bit of a hero with the superpower. But the extraordinary thing is about you and I and the power of the Holy Spirit, how we actually impact the hearts and the lives of the people around us. That's the extraordinary stuff. The dealing with poverty, the dealing with people's hearts, the dealing with shame, the dealing with, with hurt, the dealing with forgiveness, uh, the dealing with a heart that needs to be reconciled with Christ. That is the extraordinary, and that's the part that you need to do it. When I was 14 years old, I became a Christian and made a real hash of stuff. And I did that because I was 14, let's be honest, right? I made a real hash of things. And I used to go into school every day and say, I'm going to be a really good Christian today, God. And then I'd come out from school that day having having made a hash of things for, you know, which I did 80% of the time. And I'd be like, God, I don't understand why I can't do this. I don't understand why I can't do this. And it took years for it to dawn on me that I needed to go into school and walk to the bus stop in the morning and say, God, will you help me? Because I couldn't do it alone, but I didn't realize I wasn't alone. And I didn't realize I needed to ask the Holy Spirit for help. And so every single day now, when I start my work and I start the day, I take at least a moment or two and I take a few deep breaths and I say, come Holy Spirit, come and help me. Whether it's about to do a sermon or just about to do some mundane task, whatever it might be, I say, God, help me. The New Testament is the story of people who start a church, a movement, um, that changes the world because they realize that they couldn't do it by themselves. They, 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 were, they were a mess. They were despondent and full of despair. But then in the presence of Christ, who came to them physically and then presented his Holy Spirit to them, they realized they weren't alone. And then they, they did this incredible thing whereby they relied on the power of the Holy Spirit to do stuff. And the thing is, on that day, while some people left of the 3,000 and more to go back to their communities, cities, towns, and nations to start churches that would last for hundreds if not thousands of years, while some people left to do that, um, the story is not told of those people that had a great experience that day and didn't go and do anything with it. The story is not told. The reason why the story is not told is there's no story to tell. You and I could sit our whole life as Christians not relying on the work of the Holy Spirit to do something through us and would still be Christians and still go to heaven when all is said and done. 
but there wouldn't be much of a story to tell. And the challenge for us today is to, is to seek to have the, the Spirit come upon us, to be open to the Spirit coming upon us, to say day after day after day, whatever my old mundane task that I have to do today, maybe I'm not even going to leave the house much this week. Whatever it is, God, that you're asking me to do, I will try to do it willingly and I'll ask for your help to do it. And great things will happen. You can spend your entire week in the house, but praying in the power of the Holy Spirit will do more work than two or three outreach events. I'm not saying it happened all the time, but I'm saying the power of that is greater than you could ever think. So wherever it is that you're doing, in the house, in your work, in some sort of mission or ministry, whatever it is that you're called to do, ask God to come and help you do it. Because you can't do it alone. You're not alone. Let the Spirit help. I'm going to finish on... um, I'm going to finish on a a challenge, I think, and then... um, and then homework. The challenge is this. Um, many of us, if not all of us, have got pride that needs a little bit of dealing with. And the pride really is this. Now, whenever I say pride, you think, no, no, I'm not, I don't have pride. I don't think I'm amazing, right? Now, I think I'm amazing, but, you know, but I've got good reasons for that, right? Um, so that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the pride where you, you say to yourself, I, I am better than those other people. I'm talking about the most dangerous pride that exists. And that's the pride that is a whisper of a voice that says, you don't need help. You can do it by yourself. Now look, maybe you take pride in that up to this point in your life, you haven't really needed much help from people. You've been able to give more than you've been able to receive. And you haven't been a burden on others either. And do you know what? There's there's something laudable about that. You don't want to be a burden on other people. You want to be able to kind of stand on your own two feet and all of that sort of stuff. Yes, that, that is a good thing. No doubt about it, that's a good thing. But what happens with that is it, it, it spills over into an area of pride and that pride stops you from asking for help. And if you lose the habit of asking for help, then you start to make yourself a little bit of a God with a small g in your own life. And that is the most dangerous part of pride, I think, that exists in our life. It's the pride that stops us saying to the Holy Spirit, will you be involved in my life more? It's the pride that stops us admitting to some of the small sins because really we're not just as bad as some other people that we know. It's the pride that says to us, you're doing all right. You're doing all right. Coast for a bit now. You're doing, you're fine. You're fine. You don't have the same problems as other people around you. Just coast for a bit. You know, you can go a few weeks without praying too much or whatever. You'll be, you'll be all right. And those things aren't the end of the world, but they're very dangerous. And it's that pride I just want to challenge us about this morning. The pride that says, I don't want to help and I don't need to help. Um, I am that person. I am that person. I, I don't want to give everything over to God sometimes. I want to hold stuff back. I want to be self-reliant. I want to do all those things. But the more that I give towards God and the less I make of myself, the better it is for me and the people around me. That's what it boils down to. A child, a child knows that they can't do things and they ask for help. An adolescent realizes that they can do things themselves and stop asking for help. An adult realizes that they're both capable and in need of help. That's spiritual maturity. Are you an adolescent or are you spiritually or at least approaching spiritual maturity? Because adolescent faith does not want to ask for help. Spiritual maturity can both give help and receive it. That's the challenge. Is your heart open to God doing more work in your life and helping you? Not just to God, to finish this challenge 
but for others. When you ask the people who want to pray with you, there's a lot of us will sit down there. We'll have some things to pray for, but we don't want to be prayed for, um, and especially not maybe personally sometimes. I understand that. That's me too. But, but a person that approaches mature faith is strong enough to say, not only am I happy to have people pray for me, but I'll even let them do it personally because I'm willing to say I'm struggling and I need some help. Here's the homework. Um, and I'm going to finish on this. The homework is this. I want you to memorize, memorize three words. I know I should have gone for two words, but three words. I think you can do three words. Come Holy Spirit. I just want you to memorize those words. Come Holy Spirit. Because every now and again, when things are a little bit hard or there's a bit of a crisis, you're about to do stuff, you don't have the time to sit down and do your 10-minute prayer, whatever it might be, those are the, the words that I have found to be some of the most powerful words that you can say. Just come, Holy Spirit. In the middle of the crisis, in the middle of the, sometimes when you're in the middle of a conversation, you're going, what the heck is even going on in this conversation? I don't know what to do. Where you can just say it in your head straight away. Come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit. That you say that into your own life because you're struggling with things. That you say that into your, your life and into the life of the church and the people around you because you want the place to be blessed. So on and so forth. Come Holy Spirit. Um, that is your homework. Memorize those words. If I come back, if I remember, if I come back on the 5th of February and I say to you, what was your homework? Do you think you'd be able to remember that? I probably know. Who knows? Who knows? Be interested to see. Uh, be, it'd be a laugh if you didn't, mind you. Okay, look, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish at this point. Um, um, uh, I'm going to finish with a prayer. So I'll ask the worship uh, team if you want to come up for a second. I'm just going to finish with a prayer. And in that prayer, I want us to pray, come Holy Spirit, just in the silence, a number of things. And I'll hand over to Aaron after that too. Uh, and let us, uh, let us finish up. Um, uh, and, and in the prayer, I'm going to let you have a little bit of silence for you to pray for yourself, which is nice, and pray for others, which is even better. And that will grind uh, that, uh, that, that teaching. So remember, you're, you're, you can't do it alone. You're not alone. Let the spread help. Let's pray. So Lord Jesus, thank you for choosing us and for saving us. Thank you for the helper, the Holy Spirit. And right now, Lord, in the silence, we hold before you our lives and our struggles. And folks, in a few seconds in this silence, I want you to just place before the Lord things in your life in just a few seconds, and then say these words before the Lord, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. And take a few seconds to bring before the Lord people that you know, that you love, people in the community around you, people in this church, people that need help. Just, just in a moment, just let your mind drop onto the face or the lives of a person or persons around you and say, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Amen.